Well, good morning again. I know I already did this, but it's like a new role, you know. So good morning again. Uh, we're continuing our series in Cabin Fever uh, this morning, and it's my privilege to get to share with you. Have you ever thought about what your worst job experience was? Anybody? You got some bad experiences? Yeah. Uh, as a fun little get to know you, we have three uh, summer interns with us through Canada Summer Jobs, and on our first day, we got together and just had a meal together and went around the room just sharing our worst job experiences. And I've been pretty blessed to have really great job experiences all together. I actually have to say that because I'm working right now, but you know what I mean? <laughs> but there was this one job. Uh, I, was, I worked for a landscaping company for a couple months, and the work was okay, but my boss was not really a great person to work for. Uh, he paid us under the table so that he didn't have to pay taxes. He tried to cheat us on our pays. Uh, he lied to me in the interview about what the job actually entailed. And he lied to his clients to make himself look better. And then he asked me to lie on behalf of him to his clients to make him look better. So, yeah, I just, you know, there's, there's like really bad situations, like dangerous physically. And this wasn't my case. It was more a moral thing. But... Within a pretty short amount of time, I realized that I had a choice to make. Either I was going to choose to be the man that I wanted to be, or I was going to get pulled down and start compromising myself and what I believed. This morning, we're going to walk through a story uh, about David in the Old Testament. Um, you may know him better as King David. And he has a similar little ultimatum moment that he has to walk through. Specifically, we're going to talk through uh, this time when he's at the cave of En Gedi, which that video just helped to set the scene of where this all happened. So if you have your Bible or on your phone, wherever you can feel free to scroll with me, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24, that's where this story takes place. But in order to really understand the dynamics at play, I got to go back a little while when Saul was king before David and gained some context. So you can keep your finger in there at 1 Samuel chapter 24, and I'll catch up with you there in a few minutes. So the people of the nation of Israel had noticed that all the other nations around them had kings. So the people of Israel started saying, God, we want a king. Can you give us a king? And there's a whole big backstory there, but the long short of it is that Samuel, the prophet at the time, uh, he anointed Saul, with God's help, uh, this guy from the tribe of Benjamin. And he was the very first king of Israel. So Saul's reign as king, it started out pretty well. He was this tall, strong, mighty warrior who led the nation of Israel in triumph in many battles. He had this humility about himself. When Samuel, the prophet of Israel, first came to appoint Saul as king, Saul responded, but I am only from the tribe of Benjamin the smallest tribe of Israel, and my family is the least important of all the families of that tribe. Why are you talking to me like this? He's got a humility there, right? Shortly after this, he's named king. And then there was this little disagreement where there were some people who didn't want Saul to be king, but Saul was being really successful in his battles. And so Saul's men were like, we should kill these guys who don't want you around. And Saul goes, no, 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 no. No one will be executed today, for today the Lord has rescued Israel. So once again, he's got this humility. He's even worshiping the Lord, it seems. He's giving the Lord credit for his victories. But then, you know, the music changes, and things start to turn in Saul's life. Chapter 13, we see pride start to creep in. He takes credit for a battle that he actually had nothing to do with it. It was his son won the battle. He had nothing to do with it, but he said... It was his victory. And then the Israelites are facing a battle in which they are strongly outnumbered. And in order to prepare, Samuel, again the prophet at the time, he tells Saul, go down to Gilgal ahead of me. I will join you there to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. You must wait for seven days until I arrive and give you further instructions. So Saul waited the seven days. But when he saw that his troops were starting to slip away and hide because they were really nervous because they were really outnumbered, Saul decided, well, I better just offer the sacrifice myself. So he does it, and then Samuel shows up a couple minutes later, and he's appalled at Saul. 
And Saul tries to explain himself. He says, oh, I saw my men scattering from me, and you didn't arrive when you said you would. And the Philistines are at Michmash ready for battle. So I said, well, the Philistines are ready to march against us at Gilgal, and I haven't even asked for the Lord's help. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering myself before you came. We probably don't really understand what the big deal is. He was trying to do the right thing, right? Sure, he didn't follow Samuel's uh, instructions exactly, but isn't it good that he offered the sacrifice anyways before the battle? There's two problems. Firstly, in the Old Testament, God had very specifically outlined detailed ways, places, and people who could offer these sacrifices. And secondly, Samuel had given Saul very specific instructions on behalf of God for this specific battle, this specific offering. And yet Saul ignores both of them and does it his own way. See, doing the right thing wrongly ultimately makes our actions wrong. Anyways, continuing with the story, Samuel shows up. As I said, he's very upset with Saul and what he's done. And he says, how foolish. You have not kept the command the Lord has given you. Have you kept it? Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. Eesh. Talk about a bad performance review. Then another situation. Saul is in this battle with the nation of Amalek, and he's instructed to basically take no mercy completely destroy the people and all of their animals. Now, side note, I know that passages like that can rub us the wrong way. Destroy everything. I wish I had time to really dive in and uh, really give a good answer, but my brief, brief summary is that this nation of Amalek was bad news. They were a wicked people. And in order to protect Israel, Israel physically and spiritually, this nation needed to be wiped out. So, Saul ends up killing everybody, but then he keeps the best of the sheep and the cattle and the goats and the fatted calves and the lambs for themselves. And God specifically said, destroy all the animals, all the people. So, um, sorry. Uh, so then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry I ever made Saul king, for he was not he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. And Saul tries to defend himself and he says, well, I was bringing back the best to offer to you, God. So this is actually a good thing. But Samuel tells him that obedience is better than sacrifice. And because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Okay. Wow. Well, that was a really quick rise and a really quick fall of Saul, eh? You might be saying, okay, that's great and all, but where does David fit into this? I'm glad you asked. God has removed Saul's anointing and rejected him as the king, but he is still physically the king until God replaces him with someone else. So God sends Samuel into Bethlehem, and he says, find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. So Samuel, Samuel shows up at the house of Jesse, and he thinks, surely Eliab, the oldest son, surely he is the Lord's anointed. But God says, nope, not him. Okay, well then it's Abinadab, definitely, definitely him. God says, nope, not him. Uh, is it Shemia? Nope, not him either. And one by one, he continues through them all. The passage says, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel, but Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? And I'm sure Jesse's like, ah, yeah, I have an eighth. Oops, he's, he's out in the field tending the sheep. Sorry, yeah, you asked for all my sons. Yeah, I forgot one. So someone goes out, grabs David. I'm sure that makes David feel real good, forgotten by your own dad. Comes in. Samuel says, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Saul took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. So in this moment, David has 
officially been anointed to be the king. And Saul's reign is coming to an end. Then we come up to the famous story of David and Goliath. We've all probably heard that one, right? Even if you haven't been to church, really, I'm sure you've heard that story. So in this story, the Israelite and the Philistine armies, they're on opposite sides of this valley, and there's this huge nine-foot, almost ten-foot-tall Philistine champion soldier coming out to taunt the Israelites. Now, I don't look up to very many people, right? Like six and a half feet. There's very few people that I have to look up to. Nine and a half, ten feet tall, that's like... I'd be like an infant next to him. See, I hit my head on the odd door or the odd bulkhead. He'd be like just walking through the room, scraping his head on the ceiling. It'd be like a trail of stucco coming off behind him as he goes. You know those towers where they got the lights on top so that the planes don't hit them? He would need one of those. He's so freaking tall. It'd be like if I, if I climbed up on the stool. It's dangerous. And I like preach the mes- rest of the message from up here. This is actually kind of good because I can see you now. The plexiglass got the glare, but now I'm cheating the system. Anyways, it'd be like something like this, maybe even a little bit taller. That's Goliath, okay? Anyways, the point is Goliath is really, really tall. And this really tall, giant, intimidating warrior yells across the valley, Three, five, four, five. That's a paraphrase. He says, I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When... Oh, back to normal. When Saul and his Israelites heard this, they they were terrified and deeply shaken. No, really? You think they're shaken? I think I would have ran and hid because you know that they're choosing the tallest guy there to go fight Goliath, and that's probably going to be me. Actually, it probably would have been Saul. Earlier, we read that uh, Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else. So Saul would have been their best option, and he knows that, and he's probably shaking in his boots. But no matter who goes to fight Goliath, they know it's going to be far from a fair fight. Well, David isn't having any of it. David shows up to the battlefield, and he hears this taunt from Goliath, and he basically says, who does this guy think he is? Nobody is allowed to defy the armies of the living God. So he convinces Saul to go let him fight Goliath, and now... Here we have David. He's probably no more than 15, 16 years old at the time. I don't, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I remember being 15. And I was this scrawny, gangly, uncoordinated, uncoordinated little fellow. My boy's cracking all over the place. He's too small for armor, so he just goes out to face Goliath with nothing more than the clothes he put on that morning, five little stones, his shepherd's staff, and a sling. Now, if you're an Israelite... You probably can't bear to watch. You're like, I'm about to come become a slave because this guy is going to get beat down like a tied up goat. But David had a different perspective. Everyone else saw Goliath only as a giant. But David saw him as a mortal man that was defying almighty God. Goliath was too big a target to miss, and he knew that God would be fighting with him. So he yells out to Goliath with his weak, cracking voice, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. This was my life for like four years. (laughs) Today, the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And And then I will give the dead body of your men to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. I'm starting to go country. I don't know what's happening. (laughs) And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people. But now, with sword and spear, this is the Lord's battle, and he will give it you to us. 
And with that, he slings his stone at Goliath, hitting him square in the forehead, knocks him face first to the ground. And then he runs over, grabs Goliath's sword, and finishes him off. Needless to say, David becomes an instant hero. Saul makes him a commander over his army, and all that David is asked to do, he does successfully. But David's popularity continues to grow very rapidly. People are singing these songs of, Saul has killed thousands, but David has killed ten thousands. And it didn't take long for Saul, for his appreciation to change from appreciation to jealousy and anger against him. He became very nervous that the people of Israel would make David their king in place of Saul, and that David would try to kill him. So very quickly, Saul turned against him and tried to kill him. On two separate occasions, he hurls a spear at him, trying to kill him. Now, I don't know about you, but if I came in one morning and Jonathan hurled a spear at me, (laughs) I'd be out. I ain't coming back. But David does the exact opposite. Not only does he stay, but he continues to faithfully serve, protect, comfort Saul. On multiple occasions, Saul sends David out to fight battles, hoping that the enemies will kill David for him. And every time, David returns victorious. And then one night, Saul sends troops into David's house while he's sleeping to raid him and kill him. And David is able to sneak out the window just in time. David recognizes that he really can't stick around Saul anymore. Every way he turns, Saul is trying to kill him. So David decides to run the other way rather than retaliate and fight the king. David essentially has become a fugitive, running from town to town trying to escape Saul. But Saul and an army of 3,000 men are pursuing him, always right behind him. 3,000 men would have been a huge army in that day. But 3,000 men pursuing one man, it really speaks of how insecure and scared Saul was of David. Now, along David's journey, he's running, running, running. He has these 600 men along the way that join him. Some of them were people that had fought with him and they were loyal to him before, but many of them were just in some kind of trouble themselves. They were outcasts and they needed somewhere to go. So David welcomed them with him. So David gets word that Saul and his 3,000 men are right on their heels And David and his men decide to hunker down in a large cave in the wilderness of En Gedi. And now this brings us to our passage this morning. As I said, chapter 24 of 1 Samuel. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this story, I can gloss over it and think, David's running from town to town. Yeah, it probably took a couple weeks, maybe a couple months. In reality, David and most of the men with him have been running for at least four years. Some historians peg it closer to 13 years. There's unclarity. But somewhere between four, seven, 13 years, really the point is David's been running for his life for a long time. So after these four plus years, Saul tracks David into the wilderness of En Gedi. As you saw in that video uh, a few minutes ago, it was this rugged, rocky terrain And there were these large caves scattered all over the place. There's an example of one right there. So David and his 600 men, they're hiding in one of the many caves in the area, waiting for Saul to pass so they can sneak off in the other direction. Earlier in the story, Saul says, if he is in the area at all, I will track him down, even if I have to search every hiding place in Judah. So when Saul and his men come through the wilderness of En Gedi, you got to believe that they're searching through every possible cave that they can. Put yourself in David's shoes. You've been running for four years trying to escape this maniac of a king who also happens to be your father-in-law. Weird. And you hear the heavy footsteps and armor of 3,000 men outside your cave. I'm sure David and his men, they've pushed back as far as they can get into the cave, and they're trying to be so quiet, they're probably barely breathing. And then the footsteps are getting closer and closer and closer. But instead of 3,000 men, it's just one man. And all of a sudden, Saul appears at the front of the cave. He had just come out of the blistering desert sun into a pitch black cave. So you know the feeling. He can see barely 
two feet in front of him. His eyes haven't adjusted yet. But he isn't coming to the cave to search for David. He's coming to the cave to relieve himself. In other places, that word is translated to defecate. Man, the irony of this is insane. He goes, he's searching all over the place, but he goes into this one cave, just deep enough to stay out of, get some privacy from his men, and then he goes to relieve himself, to, you know, drop a deuce, to cook a butt burrito, make a deposit at the porcelain bank, to lay a brick, make some room for lunch, squeeze the cheese, release the kraken, fertilize the soil. If you were here last week, you know that Jonathan gave about 15 descriptions of vomit, so I thought I would try and <laughs> play ball with him. Turns out we're both man children. <laughs> Anyways, the point is Saul is in there dropping bombs, and he's totally oblivious to the fact that David is hiding in the back of that very cave. So one of David's men whispers to him, now is your opportunity. Today, the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy in your power to do with as you wish. Now, we don't actually have record of God ever making such a statement to David. They may have been offering their own interpretation of when David was anointed as king in 1 Samuel 16 or in chapter 18 when Jonathan, Saul's son, has formed a deep friendship with David and actually releases his right to the throne to David. Or maybe again in chapter 23 when Jonathan tells David, don't be afraid, you are going to be the king of Israel and I will be next to you. So David's men are certainly not wrong in their assertion that the Lord is going to make him king. But when they say, today, the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy in your power to do as you wish, they're likely overstating and putting words in God's mouth. But nonetheless, they've given David the encouragement that he needs, and we read, so David crept forward. And clearly, he's going to kill the king, right? Saul has tried to kill David many times. And David has barely snuck away with his life. And now, he's a fugitive from his home. He's been on the run for over four years, going from town to town to town, through the desert, through the wilderness. He's probably hungry, irritable, exhausted. He's got these 600 men who are definitely tired and disgruntled. And they want David to be king so that they can go back home and stop running for their lives. And here in this moment, in this divine moment, Saul is in their cave. Clearly, this is the moment that they've been waiting for. Psst, David, the Lord has clearly handed your enemy over to you so you can take his life and we can get ours back. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. Wait, what? David, what are you doing? This is your moment. But then David's conscience begins bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my lord the king. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed, for the Lord, has chosen, for the lord himself has chosen him. Seriously, David? Saul has been trying to kill you for years, and he is still acting king, even though you have been anointed in his place. David, you would be totally justified in slitting his throat right here, right now, and your conscience shouldn't even bat an eye. But you just cut a little piece of cloth, and you feel guilty for that? In that day, a person's robe was symbolically significant. A tearing of a robe could often represent a tearing, a torn kingdom. Um, so when David cuts off a piece of Saul's robe, in essence, it's symbolizing that Saul's hold on the kingdom is over and that David's has now begun. The reason David is conscience-stricken is that Yahweh's anointed is endowed with Yahweh's spirit. And therefore, he is holy, sacred, untouchable. And he still views Saul as the anointed one. I think it's safe to assume that when David left the back of the cave, he had every intention of killing Saul. But somewhere along the way of him creeping quietly towards him, David realized what he was doing. He probably thought, we're not in a battle. It wouldn't be a casualty of war. If I kill Saul while he's going number two, vulnerable and exposed, what kind of man am I? 
Maybe he flashed forward to a day when he's with his kids or his grandkids on his knee and, Grandpa, tell us a story. Tell us the one where you stabbed the king in the back while he was pooping. (laughs) Not the story he wants to tell. So instead of killing him, he only cuts off a small piece of his robe. But then, even then, he feels the weight of what he's done. Even though the Lord has removed his anointing from Saul and the spirit of Yahweh has departed him, David's act of cutting the robe and symbolizing the transferring of power is, in a sense, lifting his hand against Yahweh's anointed. And David's conscience feels the weight of that. So David quietly goes back to his men and he says, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord the King. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one, for the Lord himself has chosen him. To which I'm sure they said, well, if you're not going to do it, let me do it. But David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. Continuing in verse 7, after Saul had left the cave and gone on his way, David came out and shouted after him, my Lord, my King. You better believe there were 3,000 heads that went, huh? looking up at the entrance of the cave that Saul had just come out of. When Saul looked around, David bowed low before him, and then he shouted to Saul, Why do you listen to the people who say, I am trying to harm you? This very day, you can see that your own eyes, with your own eyes, that it isn't true. For the Lord placed you at my mercy back there in the cave. Some of my men told me to kill you, but I spared you. For I said, I will never harm my king, harm the king. He is the Lord's anointed one. Look, my father, at what I have in my hand. It is a piece of the hem of your robe. And Saul would have whipped his robe around and find the bottom corners cut off. He said, I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. This proves that I was not trying to harm you and that I have not sinned against you, even though you have been hunting for me to kill me. Well, when David finished speaking, Saul called back, Is it really you, my son, David? Then he began to cry. And he said to David, you are a better man than I, for you have repaid me good for evil. Yes, you have been amazingly kind to me today. For when the Lord put me in a place where you could have killed me, you didn't do it. Who else would let his enemy get away when he had him in his power? May the Lord reward you well for the kindness you have shown me today. And now I realize that you surely are going to be king and that the kingdom of Israel will flourish under your rule. Now swear to me by the Lord that when that happens, you will not kill my family and destroy my line of descendants. So David promised this to Saul with an oath. Then Saul went home, and David and his men went back to their stronghold. All right. So what does this matter for us? How does it relate to what we're going through in 2021? David wasn't isolated in the sense of being alone in a fish or in a lion's den. He was surrounded by 600 men. So while he wasn't actually physically alone, he was isolated in the fact that he was forced out of his home, his comfort, away from his family, and living on the run for years, culminating in his hiding in the cave. I think there are three great lessons that we can learn from David's experience and apply to our own life, both in general and in this season. First point is reverence. The reason that David spared Saul's life was so much less about Saul and so much more about David's reverence for God. In part of David's speech, when he comes out of the cave, he says, May the Lord judge between us. Perhaps the Lord will punish you for what you're trying to do to me, but I will never harm you. As that old proverb says, From evil people come evil deeds, so you can be sure I will never harm you. May the Lord, therefore, judge which of us is right and punish the guilty one. He is my advocate, and he will rescue me from your power. David clearly knows that Saul is in the wrong. Every person hearing that speech and seeing what David chose to do knew that David was the better man and that Saul had acted horribly and as a selfish king. And if given the opportunity, Saul would not have taken the same choice that David did. But David has such high reverence for the Lord that he is repulsed by the idea of killing the anointed one, even though it would have been incredibly advantageous to him. David will eventually get the throne of Israel, but it will be as a gift of God rather than as a result of his grasping and maneuvering. And even though Saul had his anointing removed from him 
and lost his right to reign, David still viewed him as the anointed one because God had put him in that place. His radical reverence led his thoughts and his actions. So for David, it was a closed issue. He would not show any hostility or ill will of any kind to the anointed one of God. So what does that mean for us in our world today? Honestly, I think North American followers of Jesus today, we need to rethink reverence more than ever. As we continue into a postmodern, post-Christian worldview, our culture is ever increasingly experiencing a paradigm shift that is affecting all of our lives. The primary assumption of this new worldview is that truth is relative. Truth is no longer rationale or objective, but rather, everyone's view is equally valid. Tolerance is the only acceptable doctrine in our day, and we are to accept everyone exactly as they are. In this new context, the central truths that define Christianity are being challenged. Basically, Christianity is being boiled down to believing in Jesus, believing in God, respecting Jesus, and living by the golden rule, which those are all good things, but they're just an incomplete picture of what makes up true Christianity. The ideas of sin and incarnation and redemption and judgment and repentance, these are all viewed as old, out-of-date system. And so Christianity that stands on truth-based claims is automatically ruled out as intolerant. Having reverence towards God and his word, like how David did, just seems irrelevant and misguided because it seems unnecessary in our day. Our world believes that there are other, more tolerant pathways towards God. The Christian way to him is just an outdated, unnecessary version. In 1948, C.S. Lewis brilliantly wrote about how we view God in modern times compared to ancient times. He says, The ancient man approached God as the accused person approaches the judge. For the modern man, the roles are reversed. He is the judge. God is in the defendant's seat. He is a kindly judge. If God should have a reasonable defense for being the God who permits war, poverty, disease, he is ready to listen. The trial may even end in God's acquittal, but the important thing is that man is on the bench and God is in the defendant's seat. I actually think it's gotten a whole lot worse in the last 70 years. That was almost prophetic for our time. Somewhere along the way, we started treating God like he has to explain himself to us or that he's our divine butler, or a good teacher, and Christianity is just one of the many possibilities to God. And that is just plain foolishness. We have lost reverence for the all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe to the point where there is no absolute truth anymore. Truth is just whatever you believe as long as you believe it sincerely. In our day, the idea of taking on personal risk and discomfort for the sake of faithfulness to truth, is becoming increasingly rare. David leaves us with a beautiful picture of this done right. He allows Saul to walk away unharmed from the cave. Again, not because Saul deserved it, but because he so sincerely believes in the sacredness of Saul's anointing, and more importantly, the holiness of God. What if we had an attitude of reverence like David does? that we're not willing to act or even think certain ways because it would be belittling to God. Ask yourself, where have you grown lax in your reverence to the eternal, matchless, holy God of the universe? Where have you allowed cultural ideals or your own ideals to creep in and replace the ultimate truth of God and the foundations of our Christian faith? Is there an area in your life that you need to invite the truth of God and Christianity to speak into again. I remember hearing this old-time preacher one time say something like this. God is the creator of the universe, so we do things God's way. You may have a better way, but you don't have a universe. True reverence for God means that we choose to believe that his way is the right way and go with that way even when we don't understand or agree with his ways. All right, the second lesson I think we can take from this story is to trust God. Throughout scripture, 
there are stories of God telling someone that something specific is going to happen to them in the future. But then it ends up being a long time before that happens. You know the story of Abraham? Promised you're going to have a son through all the nations of the world. We'll be blessed through him. Yeah, that happened just 25 years later. That's a long time. In the New Testament, there are multiple examples of people having ailments for years, and Jesus heals them. The woman had been bleeding for 12 years. The invalid beside the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. Even times like waiting four days to heal Lazarus. God has a habit of making people wait. In the same way, David had been anointed king, likely around the age of 15, 16, and he didn't actually get to become king until he was 30. So I'm sure if you put most of us in David's situation, we probably could have been convinced to act a little differently than him. 15 years waiting to be king after being anointed, knowing that Saul had lost his anointing, that he tried to kill you himself many times, that you've been on the run for the past four plus years, you had 600 men pressuring you to get this over with. Maybe you are holier than me, but I feel like I would have been brought to the brink. And I could definitely convince myself that the Lord had handed Saul over to me in that moment. It seemed too providential. But even at that moment, at the height of temptation, David chooses to trust the Lord. He exemplifies Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 to us. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. David understood that God and his ways and his timing is so much bigger than ours. The Lord was going to make David king, but it was going to be on God's timing. God seems to make a habit of making people wait before whatever promise or expectation is fulfilled. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. When you have to wait weeks or months or years for a promise of God to come true, it'll certainly reveal the posture of your heart. Do you actually trust God? Wait in unresolved tensions for a couple months, and I bet you'll figure it out. Either you'll be like David and his men, sorry, David's men, and try to make your own fate, or you'll wait in the tension and trust God. So why do we think it should be any different for us today, for us even in this pandemic season? God is working in the waiting. And rather than trying to force our own will, our own agenda, I believe we are being called to trust God in the waiting. Because the means that we use to accomplish a goal are just as important as the goal that we are trying to accomplish. David's goal was to become king, but he chose to do the courageous and honorable thing in trusting God and not just making his own way. So what goal are you working towards that you might have a choice to make? How you achieve that goal is just as important as the goal itself. Ask yourself, what story do I want to tell on the other side? When what you're currently walking through becomes nothing more than a story that you're going to tell, what story do you want to tell? I've experienced times of, uh, in my life where finances are tight and I catch myself thinking, well, if I just stop tithing, none of this would be a problem. I could just make my own way. But that's not trusting. That's me trying to take control to act like David's friends. But when I think of the story that I want to tell, it makes things easier. I want to be able to tell my children, tell my grandchildren, how there were seasons in my life where finances were tight and I was tempted to turn inward and just keep it all to myself and worry about number one. But I remained faithful. I never stopped living in my call to generosity as my, on, my, on my life as a follower of Jesus. I trusted him, and though there have been ups and downs, he has always been with us. That's the story I want to tell. So maybe your thing is financial, like me, or 
fudging your taxes a bit, or maybe it's a broken relationship that you see no possible way things could get better and you're ready to throw in the towel. Maybe it's a job thing. Maybe it's a health thing. Maybe you're in some thick storm that I can't even imagine. But wherever you find yourself, I believe that God is calling us to trust him. Even when the situation we're facing is really hard. Even when it looks like we don't have another option. And don't get me wrong here. I'm not trying to preach some prosperity gospel. There is definitely a possibility that at the end of your trusting, that whatever you're hoping for doesn't come to be. Or maybe you'll have to wait 15, 25 years to get there. But if you can get to a place of genuine trust in God, it's almost as if the thing that you were trusting for begins to take a back seat to the intimacy you've grown in with Christ. Trust is all about surrendering your will, your desires, your best case scenario to God. That is the only place that true relationship, true intimacy can grow. It will be one of the hardest things you ever do, but it'll also be one of the most freeing and life-giving things you ever do. Trust Jesus. Ask yourself, what story do I want to tell? And then the final point is integrity. Jonathan taught uh, a little while ago on integrity. And you may remember, he talked about the, the root word of integrity is integer. And if you're a math person, you know that integer means a whole number. So when we talk about integrity, it's like saying you are whole. You are undivided. There's no two sides about you. Who you are is who you are, no matter where you are. The person you are at home is the same as the person you are at work and at church and on the sports field and on vacation and with friends, social media, when you're in conflict with someone and when you're at peace with someone. It's the same when you're talking to someone and when you're talking about someone. When you are lonely, isolated, and tired, when you're experiencing cabin fever, more than almost any other time in your life, you will be tempted to cheat yourself to become divided. David and his men were at the end of themselves. They were tired, disgruntled, scared for their lives, and just wanting life to get back to normal. Anybody felt that way over the past 17 months? It's all too easy in those moments to choose the easy way out, to be like the 600 other men and say, well, if you're not going to do it, let me at him. I'll get us out of this mess. But David remains true to his convictions, true to who he was at the core. David was a man after God's own heart. He had the anointing of Yahweh on his life. The strongest moral decisions that we make are the ones that we make before temptation strikes. Most of us are not strong enough in the moment to maintain our integrity, to be true to our morals, if we don't create those as foundations before we have to get there. We have to pre-plan who we want to be, how we want to respond before we get into those situations. See, even though probably every single bone in David's body wanted to end things, wanted to go home, to finally be crowned king after so many years, David stuck with the hard way and chose to remain faithful to God and to Saul, even though Saul deserved the exact opposite. Here's some free advice as I'm wrapping up and the band can come back up. If you're faced with a decision, the harder way is typically the right way. I'm sure there's expectations, sorry, exceptions, but if you're honest with yourself about the options, almost every single time, the way that would be easier is most often the wrong way. It would have been so much easier to just fall into the peer pressure and take Saul's life. He would get to go home, stop running, and be king. It would have been so much easier if we didn't have to pay taxes, if instead we could use that money to buy a boat, get a bigger house. It would be so much easier to avoid tough conversation, just grow in bitterness, speak poorly about them behind their back. Maybe you're dating someone and you know they aren't right for you, but it's so much easier in that moment just to stay in it than start all over. You get what I'm saying? 
I'm not talking about like, should I have pizza or salad for dinner? There is an obvious choice, pizza, always. No, I'm talking about the big, meaningful, potentially life-altering moral decisions. 95% of the time, the easy way is not the right way. Again, ask yourself, what story do I want to tell? Living out integrity is always the harder way. But I guarantee you that whenever what you're currently walking through becomes nothing more than a story you tell, you're going to want to tell the ones where you walked in integrity, and you're going to want to avoid the ones where you didn't. This last song that we're going to sing is a beautiful combination of reverence and trust for God. So I encourage you, posture yourself in whatever manner works for you. Maybe you need to take some time during the song to evaluate the reverence you have for God or whether you really trust him with your situation or whether you can remain whole and undivided when the temptation comes. The best thing is I believe that if you genuinely ask for more reverence, if you genuinely ask for more trust, for more integrity, these are things that God will lovingly grow in you because these are traits of God that he wants to see in all of us. So let's sing together.